In order to live an extraordinary and abundant life, you must focus on your internal battle and win within. My name is Randy Wilson, and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, coming back with a super guest. I'm super excited about this conversation. We were just chatting before we hit record here and we go back a long ways. We've just recently been reconnected and I'm super excited to get to know uh, our guest. His name is Jim Bishop. Uh, Jim is a certified coach by the International Coaching Federation and also a certified leadership facilitator with Blanchard. In the October 2023 edition of LA Weekly, he was named the top 10 leadership coaches to watch in 2024. He's the founder of Conjunction Leadership, where he helps midlife executives do more leading and less reacting as they create more good in the world. He's a family man of a wonderful wife and five awesome kids. He's a fellow Hoosier, lives up in Pendleton, Indiana. If any of you are familiar with the Hoosier State, it's a little bit north of Indianapolis. Uh, But that's where Jim and I met. Uh, We were involved in a network marketing uh, company back in the day, probably 2010, 11. I was trying to think through the exact time frame, but probably 2010, 11, 12, maybe something like that. So close to 10, 11, 12 years ago. And like I mentioned, we just were recently reconnected and this is going to be a super fun conversation here. We're going to have with Jim. So Jim, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for having me, Randy. Yeah. So as I mentioned there, we have a little bit of a connection back in our network marketing days, but I gave the, just the high level bullet point list of some of the things that you've been involved in the things that you're doing. Uh, take us a little bit deeper, show us and tell us a little bit more about Jim, kind of where you are, where you've been. Obviously I want to get to know a little bit more as well. We've been re- just recently reconnected, but yeah, I'm super excited to learn more about you. Absolutely. Well, I'm a, I'm a reformed corporate warrior, um, 25 plus years in corporate America in, in various different roles, kind of working through the sales and marketing pathway to begin with, and then ending up um, quite a bit of my experience in leadership development, leadership training, uh, organizational design, HR, HR type of structures, talent management, career pathing, and ultimately ended the career um, in life sciences with um, an executive coaching focus. Um, and so, um, you know, the long journey in that, in that rumbling, a lot of experiences there, um, physically was classically trained as a scientist to begin with and ended up going into this people world, realizing that the science was the easy part for most people to solve, but the people were the hard parts. Um, After having worked in corporate America for that long, picked up some of the greatest examples of leadership and probably some of the most tragic examples of leadership along the way. Um, Watched many leaders um, thrive while any, some other leaders, um, what I would say is dived. Um, I know the appropriate word is dove, but thrived and dived, and at the same time, um, started gaining lots of lessons myself as I was leading teams and organizations. Um, The pandemic of 2020 and all the social unrest of our culture during that period of time, coupled on with the reverberating uh, reverberating challenges from the hashtag MeToo movement, all of those things were kind of surrounding the leaders at the time, if you would take us back to that. And I could just see that there was um, a seismic shift coming from what employees expected in their workplaces and leaders were horribly prepared to deal with it. So in the pandemic of 2020, when I had two kids getting ready to launch to college and all the world was upside down, I decided it was time to bring this leadership to to a different level and pivot out and started conjunction leadership at that time. So we've been operating for now four years. Um, We built many different types of services. Today, we have the opportunity to work with primarily executives who sit at the top of their pyramid. Um, That may be in large organizations or as the founder entrepreneur of a smaller organization. Um, We have the opportunity to help them scale and grow through their leadership and their teams. And we do a lot of what I would call culture mapping on the side of that as well. So um, that's where the practice is today. And I can't wait to dive a little bit deeper. Uh, In my background, I was a retail manager. So I was in charge and leading small teams, right? We'd have anywhere from 50 or so people in the building at any given time, right? Different parts, different organizations of the, of the store. And so leadership, the, the topic of leadership is something that I studied a lot. I don't study it as much as I used to. Obviously I try to uh, incorporate a lot of things that I learned, but I'm excited to dive in a little bit deeper into that subject and how you've taken that idea and that concept, right? And then launched it out into this 
venture called Conjunction Leadership, where you're helping executives do better, right, for their communities, for their businesses, but then also for their families and then for themselves. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what that looks like as far as, like I mentioned, they might be studying leadership, but I think you come to it with a little bit of a different slant that might be, you know, perceived as a little bit different, but at the same time could be so impactful. Yeah, well, I, I certainly, I, I think I have to describe kind of my my why first and then back into the what. So, you know, after having worked in many different organizational structures for a while, the one thing that I could clearly say is um, people, the flame started to go out, both in employees and leaders over a certain period of time. Um, and candidly, work started sucking the life out of way too many people for way too long. And I, I think most people have had that experience at some point in their journey. You could look back and say, what's the what's the cause and what's the 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 answer to that problem? But in reality is, I have to believe that we were put into our work to actually give us the training ground to make our culture and society a better place to be, right? So I look at our work as a training and proving ground for us to practice and trial and experiment with a lot of things so that we should be able to serve our families and our communities and continue to grow a hurting world. But when work sucks the life out of us, what happens is anything but that. So we come home and we don't serve our families and we don't serve our communities and our world doesn't grow into the deepest problems that it currently has. And so we, we run in a world devoid of leadership. And yet we try to practice leadership in our organizational structures every day. And we supposedly have leadership development programs that help us. We even have um, uh, college educations that can be centered around it. But really what that type of leadership is, is how to run a business, right? How to control and direct, optimize and plan everything out so that it, it all works like a fine oiled machine. And that works if we're manufacturing things. That doesn't work if we're putting people into an organizational structure who are flawed and broken. And we expect that, that organizational structure to work seamlessly. So um, my purpose is to make sure that work doesn't suck the life out of us anymore. And I also believe that in order to do that, uh, leaders have to go first in that journey, that they have to go the, to become a better human themselves so that life doesn't get sucked out of them. And then they can model and, and clear the way for other people to follow behind that. And so my main focus is to work with those individuals who are responsible for larger systems or structures to help them see the humanity in themselves um, so that they can also then see humanity in other people. And we can we can adapt our corporate structures to being more human and adaptable rather than optimized, structured, planned, and controlled all the time. So it's more of a personal development journey for that leader, I would assume. Is that, I mean, in just a very small nutshell, is, is that what I'm hearing? It's more of a discovery from within themselves of how they are, how they're acting, being in their environment. Obviously, that impact yeah. they have on their individuals and their people they're working with. Absolutely. I mean, you know this better than most, but in the entrepreneurial journey, business growth is first personal growth, right? Um, and it's very direct. The faster, the more that I tap into myself and I show up differently, my business grows because I do things differently, right? Um, in the larger, more corporate, maybe siloed and hierarchical type of organizations, it's less of a quid pro quo, but it's still there. The more that the leader works on themselves, the more the business will grow as well. But what happens is there's just many more layers of translations and a lot more separation from the front line where revenue actually is generated in a corporate structure. So people won't attribute it that, that deeply or that directly. But I, I have to believe that when I, when I work with a leader, they may come to the coaching conversation because they're having a difficult conversation with an employee or they're having a challenge with their board or they're seeking their next round of funding and they have a business presenting challenge. And that, that we'll work on that for a little while. We'll coach the what. But eventually what happens is when a pattern starts to emerge and they see that this same difficulty exists with another employee or the same problem exists with another board member, or we're going through the next round of funding and we're facing the same challenge, eventually it truncates back to what is the common problem. And what I do as a coach is, you know, there's a lot of annoyances in our systems. There's a lot of things that we can get frustrated with. And we try to point the finger outward and control all of those things so that we get our way. 
And the reality is over time, the most controllable thing, the harder thing, but the most controllable thing is to operate on ourselves. And so if I can get a leader back into the center of their own power and their own accountability, then they can, sh they can choose to show up differently in each of those situations and change themselves so that the situation changes itself. But they can't control all the other variables that make that situation change. What they can control is themselves. So in my coaching relationships, we really do take a whole person perspective. And oftentimes the problem really isn't the problem. The problem that they're focused on isn't the thing that's really causing them the biggest issue. Um, particularly with my male clients, we just have, they just have a tendency to overemphasize their importance at work and underemphasize their importance in the other relationships they have in their life. Because work to them is probably the most controllable. But navigating complex emotions with other family members or navigating complex situations in their community are things that they just don't have enough practice with and they don't feel like it's as controllable. So their default mechanism is to come back over to the box of work or vocation and over-focus in those buckets. Love that. So taking control on the Rich Mind Podcast, I'm talking about that all the time, taking control of that inner chatter, that inner dialogue, those those emotions, those feelings, understanding that they're there. I'm not, it's, I say it all the time. It's the hardest work I've ever done in my entire life. But if I, I've, what I've discovered, and I, I'm hearing this through what you just described is that the harder I work on me on, and on myself and in those categories, the better my outside world, my 3d worlds begins to become better relationships with my wife, obviously then with my kids, being able to show up and have this conversation with you today, Jim, uh, it's just, it's an amazing thing that if you can get that reflection back on, and turn on those, those receptors, maybe, I guess, those, those, uh, those intentions to become a different individual, how that can really impact uh, people going forward in, in all aspects of your life. Like you said, you don't necessarily have control then of the people, the pieces, right, of the outside world, but at the same time, it, it, it absolutely is impacting them in a positive way. And that's, that's beautiful. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I tell people, I mean, resilience is the, is the word I tend to use because that's what it resonates with most people. And we want to be resilient through turbulence. And if there's anything we're living through right now, it's a lot of turbulence in our, our, our environment, right? And when things feel turbulent, what people do is they grasp onto control. And it's, it seems logical to try to control the situations around us because it feels out of control. We don't know what to do about the politics. We don't know what to do about the culture. We don't know what to do about our home life sometimes. So we try to control all of those things. And in reality is the reason that we do that is because we feel out of control ourself, not the situation, but ourself. I don't often have an understanding or a groundedness in who I am as a person, what my, my more existential purpose might be. We don't have an understanding of the emotions that I'm currently experiencing. We, we don't really even understand some of the experiences that we've been through in our life because we've either just dismissed them as good or bad, not necessarily relative to my overall development. And so if we can tap into that, if I help leaders tap into who am I and what am I here for? What has my experience been? What has informed my perspective? What is giving me the confidence that I can invest and count on myself, um, that I am worthy of who of, of what I do? I don't have to strive to try to earn that anymore. What happens is that feeling of control comes back and my center of resilience starts exponentially growing and I can survive the turbulence, not because I've reached out to gain control, but because I've rooted down to gain control. And if we root down into our core of who we are as a person, and we do the thing that only we can do better than most, then we tend to get along a lot better in this world. We don't look at other people as competition. We don't look at other people as trying to take us down. We're not as hijacked by all the turbulence going on. And we can just focus on the thing that we do better than most. And guess what? In entrepreneurial sense, that means your business exponentially grows. Love that too. Love that too. I told you that. That's why I was so excited about this conversation. I totally align with everything you just said. So let's, a little bit of a curveball. We're talking about leadership, which is fantastic. Let's go a little bit more down the entrepreneurial journey aspect of, of as I mentioned, we met when we were early in our entrepreneurial journey, right? Trying to figure out business, trying to figure out sales, trying to figure out becoming more, right? All the personal development things, which has led us then to where we are today, where you're four years into now this, this uh, successful uh, leadership 
consulting and coaching business, right? I'm obviously trying to launch the podcast and doing different things on my own as well. So what I love to do on the podcast is to kind of reach a hand back and offer the, the folks that are listening some wisdom, some nuggets of wisdom of kind of the journey. Where have you been? How you were able to get through that to having the confidence to really step into, like you said, who you are who you really are. I think in our little dialogue back and forth last week, when we were reconnecting, you were saying life is better than it's ever been. And that's fantastic, right? So if people are looking for something like that, they know that it's out there, they know that they can find it, but they're just not sure where to even begin. Do you have any, can you go back to that, you know, maybe 10, 12 years ago when you were uh, starting to branch out and trying to figure out your own entrepreneurial journey and how you've gotten to where you are today? Yeah, I, I think I, my entrepreneurial journey probably goes back longer than 10 or 12 years, to be honest. I was raised in a very entrepreneurial family. Like um, many generations before me have never worked for someone else. They've only worked for themselves. Um, my journey was different than that. I went to school, got my master's and believed that my education was going to propel me forward into a successful career. And I tended to put a lot of my uh, identity in my intellect and in my ability to relate to other people. Um, and when people told me you had intellectual aptitude or you, you were really good in school, then I just kept going to school and I got a master's. And then when I got done with that, I decided I would go use that master's. And then I started following that path and putting my agency outside of myself to give other people the opportunity to affirm what was inside of me. Right. So, I became smarter, I worked harder, I did all of these things, which allowed me to feel good when other people recognized that. But what I wasn't getting was that sense of personal autonomy in my daily life, the way that I wanted to build my life. And I, it, it honestly took me 25 years in corporate America in a corporate role to try and find that. I knew every now and then I would bump up against the edges and I would knew, I would feel that, you know, the, the, the feeling of imposition that I was doing things to please other people didn't feel right to me, or the feeling that I was working outside of the boundaries of what I wanted to commit to myself about doing the extra hours or the extra travel or the nights on the road. Um, those things did not feel good, but I didn't take account of what it was doing to my soul or my inner being. Um, I took account to, the, I, I'm the, the protector and the, the provider for my family, and I've got to do these things because that's what's required of someone in such a role. It was, it was in this kind of overall feeling of um, maybe the clothes were getting a little tight, you know, almost as if I had outgrown some things, but I didn't know exactly what. Um, that all started to rumble about the time that you and I met. And there was an itch I was trying to scratch. Um, network marketing entered, entered the picture and it was an opportunity to say, how could I build a business that didn't require a lot of investment or overhead capital, right? Somebody else was providing the product. I just had to build the relationships and build the business. And it, it was scratching something that, that was coming alive in me. The fact that I could one, be in control of my day, two, I could be in control of my family and two, I could do those two things together. Um, and while I was doing that, I could build a pretty successful income along the way. And all it required was me to be me, not me to be what somebody else expected of me. Um, those were some of the, 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 I guess, boundaries that were starting to, to fall down around me and I could see a bigger picture. And I also reflected back on my childhood. Like I, I'd never witnessed somebody going to work and working for someone else. I always witnessed our family being able to do things um, while my parents earned income, right? So that to me was something that I, I kind of held on to and really wanted. Um, now, what I see in myself and I also see in many of my clients is sometimes you don't choose this because it, it feels very uncomfortable. Sometimes it chooses you and you have to step into that uncomfortable nature, right? So unfortunately, I worked in the people world of business. It's not a revenue generating center of the business. Um, that meant three times within four years, my role was deemed redundant, um, meaning that it was going to be restructured. And so, yeah, there's an opportunity to find something that's close or tangent to what I was doing and hang on and hold on for the next opportunity and hang on and hold on for the next opportunity. And then by the third time, I'm thinking, do I really want to hang on and hold on any longer? Right. Um, I moved to uh, the parent company of our subsidiary and I thought, well, this will be a nice change. I'll get to 
reinvent myself and learn something new. And I got some tremendous, tremendous experience that I will never, ever regret. But at the same time, the clothes still were a little too tight, right? The autonomy still wasn't there. If anything, the expectations were only bigger and the audience that I was working with was only more demanding. And so I started to scratch and and feel really itchy on the inside. And I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that feeling was. I just knew that something wasn't aligned. Um, a, a couple good business coaches, a couple good personal coaches along the side of me at the time helped me kind of see that there was more inside of me than what I was giving myself credit for. I thought my worth came because of the brand that I worked for. Um, I thought my worth came because of the business card that I carried. I thought the reason that people listened to me was because I had done these things for this company. What I realized through that journey was I was worthy because I had these experiences. I was worthy because of my childhood experience. I was worthy because of my educational experience. I was worthy because of my foundation of who I was as a person and my understanding of what I was bringing to the world. And it became much more comfortable for me to bet on myself than it was to continue to bet on the company who was betting on me, right? That's very indirect. Um, every day going to work, trying to play part of the game to help other people know what you did and what you were doing so that you could be, be talked about in a room when you weren't there. Um, that was draining me. But when I finally realized if I bet on myself, all of that goes away. So fast forward, um, what I learned in network marketing, certainly valuable. The relationships I picked up in that, certainly valuable. The relationships I picked up in 25 years of corporate America, invaluable. And in 2020, when most of my clients were trying, internal coaching clients were trying to figure out who they were and what they wanted to do all over again, and whether or not this pandemic was serving them or they were serving it, what the, the and we can all see now the great resignation was right thereafter. What was happening was a lot of my clients were choosing to go external and they were choosing to go to another employer and they wanted to take me with them. Um, not in a physical employment sense, but in a contracted coach sense. And I could see that there is a pathway and a runway here for me to build a business off of this. It just would require that I separate so that there was no longer a conflict of interest. So in 2020, when the world was upside down, I chose this was the time I was going to bet on myself. Now, we love, everyone loves the rag to riches story, right? They love the, this worked and just look at me and it was a perfect success. And I will say it was much better than I had ever anticipated. But what you alluded to was a lot of the mental games start coming in, right? The security of a every two week paycheck is now gone. What does that mean? Well, one, it means I have multiple clients and I'm not beholden to a single client anymore, a single paycheck. Um, well, that doesn't seem all that bad because before I was subject to someone's choice, whether or not I got to stay or I had to go. And I was a single source of income, but there is some insecurity there with thinking that that was stable. Now what I have is not stable. And then there's the mind game of also wondering like, what happens if I quit? What happens if this doesn't continue? What happens if, right? Um, and all the what if abouts that go in your, the back of your mind. Um, then the dream demons and the belief bullies, I call them, start setting in, right? Like what gives me the right to be able to do what I'm doing? Or if I want to do this and get bigger or grow stronger, grow more, oh my gosh, look at all the things that have to happen. Like I don't have a corporate IT department behind me anymore. I'm gonna have to figure out how to use these things, right? And there's hurdles and challenges and all that, but it comes back to the central thing is, I'm not gonna fail because I bet on myself. I'm not betting on anything else in this journey. I'm betting on the fact that I am worthy of what I have. And I have a, a, a queer oddity about me is that I think harder and longer about this stuff called people and leadership than most people ever will. Like if I have the chance to pick up a podcast or a book, I'm going to pick up one that has to deal with something in social psychology or organizational dynamics. Um, if I, get stuck in a situation and I can't decide how to move forward. It's because I can't resolve in my own mind. What is, what's wrong with this people aspect? It's not the production aspect. It's why, why do we have disharmony or disunion in, amongst the group? Um, and then I realized that what I thought made me weird is actually what makes me better. I stepped into that and said, I'm just going to do what only I can do. That makes me weird and better at the same time. So um, there's a lot of lessons there, but I think it, if, if there's one message that comes across to anyone 
listening to this that's either in the entrepreneurial space today or that is thinking about entering the entrepreneurial space is what is it that only you can do that makes you worthy and that you just bet on yourself more than you bet on anything else? And step into it, having the courage. So that discovery phase, I just want to dig a little bit deeper. You did, you shared that, that was a ton of wisdom right there. So folks, if, yeah, I would, re, I would rewind that and listen to that over and over and over. That was, that was super powerful because I, I could relate a lot of that story with myself when I was in the corporate world as well and trying to figure all that out. But so one question I have for you, cause I've got my answer. I'm curious what yours is, is that when you're through that discovery phase and as you mentioned, it was just the burnout, right? You just didn't want to do it anymore. And that's kind of how I was as well. Did you, was there a practice? Was there anything that you did uh, to try to flush out some of these thoughts, some of these ideas? Did you seek wisdom from, from physical people? Did you go uh, learn from virtual people? Does that make any sense? I'm a big advocate of journaling. I love getting my ideas out on paper so that way I can see them. And it's almost like they become real. Is there anything like that, that you did that, that when you discovered that it's like, okay, I've, I've got to bet on myself, but it was a little fuzzy maybe as far as like what the process. Did you do anything to kind of get some clarity there? Uh, I did. And at the risk of sounding like a shameless plug, I put it into an ebook that people can download. Um, I just call it Mastering Midlife Leadership. Um, there are nine different things, nine different practices or power moves that I included in that, that ebook for people who are kind of in this space. Um, and some of it is, it, it's not necessarily just about journaling. A lot of it is about like taking account into your emotions. Um, particularly for dudes, right? We're, we're not all that fluent in what is going on that's not in our head. Um, and the two emotions that most men are allowed to feel are either lust or anger. And those are the ones that people will attribute with the male attribute. But there's a whole lot more that go on in the male psyche, but we just don't know the language. So in that whole process of trying to figure it out, when I was describing, I felt itchy, I really had to start naming the emotion because if I didn't, it was it's controlling me anyway. Um, if I felt shame because I was doing something, it's going to control me. If I felt joy, it's going to control me, right? And then once I learned to use my emotions as my beacons and my, my guides, um, it was much easier for me to control them than for them to be controlling me. So that, that's really one of them. The practice of stillness and slowing down and creating space is another huge one, right? Because I had become overly addictive to the dopamine hits or the thrill of the kill, if you will, sending the email, answering the message, proving to my boss or my, my superiors that I was worthy. Those things gave me quick hits of dopamine, but really what my brain craved was serotonin, the feeling of being relaxed, the feeling of being peaceful, the feeling of being in control. Um, I had to find ways to get my neuroscience to match with what I desired. And that meant coming to myself in a way that created space in the daily schedule and the daily routines. Um, there are many other practices out there that I think are helpful. Um, I, like I said, I included them all there and we, we probably don't have time to go through them all, but um, just getting into a pattern of rhythm within yourself is probably the biggest one. Um, to know what, to get quiet, to be comfortable with the things that aren't comfortable inside of you right now, and to just let them be, um, to understand that journey is a journey, not an, a process of the burning bush moment when it all gets revealed to you that this is exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Um, I think the, one of the, the best uh, feelings was when I could look backwards and say, everything that has happened up to this point has been purposeful and needed for me to be where I'm at at this point, even if it was some of those what I call shit pie moments, even when you found out your job was going away, even when someone in your, your close social circle died, even when you hit rock bottom in, in some of your emotional states. Um, I think those are the moments when I look back and I go, those things were actually there to help shape and guide to where I'm at today and develop the relationships that I needed to make this successful. So um, another, another part of the journey that I, it's uncomfortable to talk about, but I think it needs to be talked about in this is sometimes the process of becoming feels a little bit like you're falling apart, right? Of the process of getting to where you need to be there's a piece of you that has to die. And when that piece of you has to die or that identity needs to be stripped, 
we can often misattribute that to depression or anxiety, or we can misattribute that to a clinical diagnosis because that makes us feel as if it's justified. And I'm not saying that there aren't those situations that occur, that there are certainly neuroscience for, for people that create clinical states. Um, I also think it's for a lot of people not being attuned to what this soul speak is. And when something is rising up inside of you that is so important that it has had to get out, like maybe you've suppressed it for a very long time and you keep shoving it back down, but it will make itself present. When there is a tension between the inside and the outside, and I just call that integrity, you're not, you're not truly living to who you know you should be uh, or who you know you could be. When that is happening, a lot of guys particularly get into this state of saying, I don't know, I think I'm going crazy. And it is almost as if they have too many browser tabs open and their CPU processing speed just keeps draining. And they're sitting there going, gosh, I feel tired. I feel lethargic. I just don't even want to try. And they go back to saying, do I have a clinical diagnosis of low testosterone or anxiety or depression? And when they do, they, they seek more medical interventions rather than maybe a more ethereal, spiritual, inner awakening type of intervention. And sometimes they need both. But in many times, what we need is just a guide or a coach or somebody who has been there and can say, this is a normalized state of being and what is coming, coming next is far greater than what you're leaving behind. Like, let's just start stepping into some of those processes of deconstructing or disrupting what you already know so that we can bridge to where you want to be and so that you can grow to become what you want to become. But if we want the growth stage, we first have to be comfortable with the disruption stage. Love it. So that takes you directly. That was a perfect lead into your, your process, right? Let's talk about that a little bit, your process of disrupt bridge and then grow. So when you're talking with executive level leaders and they're maybe a little bit of pushback, right? They're, it's like, this is maybe new to them. Maybe they're not as, uh, engaged with their emotions, with their thoughts, with their feelings and that type of thing. Uh, how is there like a, a, like almost like a, a normal thing you see? Is there something like a pattern that you see from, from levels that have made it that far? Maybe they are all about the accolades with, with the title, right? With all of the stuff that's going on, all the noise that's going on. Is there a pattern that you see that with, with your process of the disrupt bridge and grow that you've seen that really can impact people? Sure. Let me, let me answer that in um, several parts, right? So I told you I kind of grew up in corporate development, corporate training, leadership development, right? So that, what that meant is for many years, I put butts in seats um, and we did training programs and we called it development. And for certain levels of leaders, it would work, right? Maybe if I've never been a manager in my first level of experience of managing people, there's some disciplines that I can learn or some skills that will help. Maybe even as I move from manager to uh, a, a, a leader of leaders, you know, there's some things that I need to learn and some whatever. But as you move up in that journey, what I would experience is training was less effective for certain people. Um, for the people who had enough experience, they did not need more skill. What they needed was to verbalize the skill that they already have and repurpose it so that they could create other leaders behind them. They needed a way to translate their leadership, if you will. Um, what I recognized through that was training isn't needed for the certain people, but coaching is. Um, coaching is really about less of me holding someone accountable and more about helping them hold themselves accountable for the things that they could be doing but aren't. Um, the things that they know will get them to the better future but don't. And so a large part of that coaching journey is to help them shed some of the previous identity of whatever level or whatever role or whatever per person they used to be so that they can get to where they want to be. And that's why the disruptive stage is so important in the coaching journey is we're, we're really pushing into a place where people haven't gone before, but know they want to. And when you just haven't done it before, there's fear and insecurity, just like stepping into entrepreneurship, right? There's all the belief bullies and dream demons that get in the way. There's all the people in your life that want to pull you back and say, just be comfortable doing what you're doing. Um, so you have, to, you have to change the internal way that you see yourself or the sense of identity so that all of these external things can start falling into place later on in the journey. So 
that, that's the first way that I would answer that question is what, why does this process work and how do we use it? Well, it doesn't work in training. There's no way to teach someone this stuff. It works in coaching because I can help you get understanding of what is making you uncomfortable today and what are the belief, the beliefs and the, the truths that you've come to assume as gospel truth in your life today because of your experience that may not be serving you as you move through this next experience. Um, you know, for example, if we think the world is flat, we're not going to travel very far, right? So we probably need to disrupt the belief that the world is flat. Um, there are a lot of people who, a lot of leaders who grew up with beliefs that people can't be trusted. Like, and if you have that belief because of all of your experience in the past of where you've, your trust has been violated, you will lead very differently going into the future. You will lead with much more control and process around you, and that will restrict the autonomy and freedom that most cultures need to thrive. Um, so we can we can get down into the nitty gritty of a person's story and understand where those beliefs are coming from, what needs to be disrupted, so that when we get to the bridging stage, we can paint a crystal clear picture of what tomorrow needs to look like for them, so that they have much more reason to jump to forever island rather than today island, right? And when they get there, then the next stage of it is growth. And in the coaching journey, what that really means is they come back to me in each session with their accountability. Like, this is what I want to work on. This is what I want to deal. This is where I'm going. This is the support I'm going to need. And all they're doing it really by the time we get into that, they're like, why do I need you? Because I'm doing all the work. And I'm like, yes, that's exactly what you're doing is the client does the work and you move to your better future. I'm just here to hold your dream for you a little bit tighter than what you could hold it for yourself in the midst of living in your own head. Shine the light on it, right? Show them that what's possible, right? And like you said, just kind of let them keep stepping into that uh, that dream future. That That's super cool. So when they, I assume that they, you get a little bit of pushback from the beginning. So the process of getting somebody, how engaged do they have to be from the beginning? Like if, I assume if someone's reaching out to you, Jim, they're at the point where it's like, all right, something's got to change. You know, I don't know what it is. All of, you know, this group isn't doing what they need to do. Obviously sales might be down, right? The engagement level, how engaged does somebody have to be to really see the process that you're bringing to them to really see that, that uh, take off and to find their dream future? Yeah. Um, let me, let, I'm going to, I don't want to not answer your question, but let me, let me first describe maybe the ideal client and where their, their archetype is. And then we'll answer the engagement question, like how engaged do they need to be? Because the archetype will help answer that a little bit. But you know, the, the person that I tend to work with tends to be a midlife male executive. Um, I mentioned they sit at the top of the pyramid. Most of the people who find me happen to be men. I think just my lived experience um, and getting to share my story a little bit, they see that. Um, generally somewhere about the age of 37 between there and maybe 55 56 is where most of my clients tend to reside in the continuum of life um, and something transitional happens at that point in their life right so they've worked really hard they've hustled for everything they've gotten they set their goals and ambitions early in life and they set singular focus on getting them and they did all the things that many people at those stages of life have done. So they went to a good school, they got good grades, they got a degree, they got the diploma, they got the job, they got the mortgage, they got the spouse, they had the kids, they bought the cars, they got the house, you know, and so therefore there is a track record of all the trappings of success. Everyone on the outside looks at them and says, man, you have an amazing life. I want to be you, right? And so they, they know what got them there. They know all of this work and effort and planning and controlling and the ability to work, to, um, to prioritize and multitask. It, it got them to what they wanted and it's generally worked for them. And now somewhere between that 37 and 55 mark, what happens is my responsibilities have continued to increase. My kids are getting older. I now see the emotional demands are there. There may be some shifts where a few of them are starting to leave the house. My emotional capacity with my spouse is much different than it used to be. Um, that we, don't, we haven't related for so long because what we're doing is just managing the household. Um, I've increased in my 
my vocational responsibility as well. I have more people or more responsibility in the office. I have a bigger title. There's more demands on my time. And there's also this calling that what's going to happen when I'm gone? Like my time is finite. I don't have as much discretionary time as I used to. Yeah, I bought the boat, but it sits in the garage because I never have time to use it anymore. And all these things that I have have started to own me more than me owning them. And there's this rising up inside of my most, most of my dudes at this time where they're, they're starting to wonder, like, is this all there is? But now I feel very guilty about asking, is this all there is? Because I have so much. And I can't, I, I feel like I'm trapped because I can't let too many people know that I'm still searching for more when I have a lot because it seems like I'm ungrateful for what I, what's worked. And then if I want more or I want something different, I have to also be in out of congruence with who I am as a person and go, I don't want what I got anymore. I don't want to work the way that I've worked anymore. And that feels like I'm losing part of my identity because everybody knows that I hustle and I grind and I can outwit and outplay and outsmart everyone. And if I have less discretionary time to do all of that, and I don't know that I want to do it anymore, and I feel like I'm losing, what's going to happen is I play not to lose. I no longer play to win. So all of that said, how engaged does a client have to be? Well, when they find me, candidly, they're not all that engaged because they're playing not to lose. They feel like I'm, I'm not who I used to be my virility or my power or my my chutzpah or my mojo they'll use all different words it's it's not what it used to be i don't enjoy getting up as much as i used to be i don't find satisfaction in the things that i used to and they don't they don't know how to describe that and candidly i'm usually not the first person they called right and i'm not the first person that has noticed um Generally, someone in their environment has finally said to them, what's going on, Randy? You're not who you used to be. Um, when someone sees that about them, they're like, uh-oh, I've been found out. Everything that I thought I was hiding is no longer, is no longer hidden. And now what's going to happen? Like, am I going to lose my job? Am I going to lose my reputation? Am I going to lose my family? Like, and they start getting all um, inflamed about some of those things. So... Honestly, when they find me, they're engaged in the process of knowing something is not right. They are not engaged in the process of growth yet. All they know is what's been working for me is no longer working and I better do something. Um, I wish there were, I wish everybody who was experiencing that realized this is a normal thing and I can get through it. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't think there are very many people who are courageous enough to actually say this is a solvable issue. I think a lot of people just shut up and put up and hope for retirement so that they have enough discretionary time that they can at least re-energize their battery when they're 60. Um, they dream about going on vacation or they dream about living on the beach. They don't dream about giving themselves autonomy back in their day. Um, they don't know what that looks like. And so that's where this rumbling of, if you're feeling out of control, let's put you back in control of getting of who you are as a person and what's made you and where you're going. So. Does that help answer the question on engagement? Yes, it did. Yeah, it did. So that's that's fantastic. I love how you went there and and bridged that gap for me, right? As far as uh, paint a little bit more color into that into that question and answer it even a little bit better. So, is there? Can you think of? And I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, and hopefully you can come up with something. I assume that you can. But the can you think of a like a, a success story, right? Can you think of a client that came to you that uh, without naming any names or anything like that? Don't need to get any of the specifics, but can you kind of Give us some uh, texture of a story where they came to you with this issue. You help them, right? Through your process, get them to this dream or a better outcome that they can even have imagined uh, when they first met you. Yeah, I, I um, all of my clients have success stories and I love that's the best part of my job is I get to be a part of them. I get to I get to be witness to the rebirth and the rejuvenation of, of a leader um, and more broadly, the impact of that leader across their teams and organizations and their 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 uh, community. Um, so, you know, classic archetype I just told you about the background and the situation is this individual is a, a very intellectually astute individual. Um, never it did it didn't it, it started with an internship, 
started with a guy that could fix all kinds of things and displayed a lot of uh, technical competence, not without the degree, but just because he was a natural tinkerer, um, worked his way through the internship into a full-time position. That company put him through college so that he could um, continue to provide value to this organization while he got his education. After getting his education, moved into several different managerial positions and worked his way through a division of the organization and then another division of the organization, not because he had the technical competence, but because he had the intellectual competence of being able to learn and amass all these types of things. Rose to the level of finally being the CEO of this large organization, um, multinational organization. Again, with the identity that I am a very intellectual person and I'm smarter than most people and I have amassed a lot of information through this organization, rises to this level of CEO and the board also recognizes he's not been a CEO before, so they decide to hire a coach. Um, he was aware of the opportunities before him. He was not aware of his proclivities or his patterns. And so I, I use a couple instruments that help us um, map our reactive tendencies of how we've learned to show up in the rules or what we believe are the rules of the world. And then it helps us identify what are our creative opportunities to move into a self-authoring future. Um, through this experience, this individual realized this, this ability to be smarter than most people had helped him in many ways. And yet in the role of CEO, it was actually hurting him. His presenting challenge really was, I have way too many direct reports and I don't have enough time and everything. everybody wants time on my calendar and I don't have enough, enough calendar space to do it. And if I'm gonna do all the strategic leading part of this and the communication of the vision and enrolling of the board, I've gotta get rid of some of these people, right? And that was what I want, he wanted to do was, let's, let's figure out how to downsize my executive team. Um, we get into it and we realize this over ability to be smarter or over identity of being smarter than most people is ruining it because when people come to him for advice or support, what he does is tell them the answer because he's smarter than them. And when they, when he sees an opportunity that maybe the sales and marketing team aren't doing what they need to do, he wants to add a new sales member to give them capacity. So he starts searching for the new salesperson because they're not competent to hire a new salesperson. Um, when the R&D team needs to come up with a new product to help bridge the gap or close the plan, he's conducting the meetings for the new products planning team and organizing the agenda to bring people in all around the world. Well, where all of these things are consuming the calendar time. They're not allowing him to do the executive functioning that he needs to do. Well, why? Where is it coming from? Well, in reality is because he's overly identified with being an intellectual individual who is smarter and winning most arguments on his intellect. And he had to shed part of that identity and realize that I don't want to be smarter than anyone anymore. And if I do shed that identity, look at all the opportunities I have to do the executive functioning of what I've been hired to do. If I don't shed that identity, the board is probably not going to be very happy that they put me in this role anymore because I don't have a following anymore. People aren't responding to me. And I'm always trying to win arguments, not bridge the gaps. Right. And so over the course of time, it's the old person still rises up, but my job is just to reflect what's the better future you're trying to go towards and how do we keep moving towards that future in a self-authoring way? What do we have to give up? What do we have to pick up and where do we get to go? Um, and so the, the, the success story here is the board is phenomenally pleased. The business is growing better than it's ever grown. It's not without its own pain. And as you alluded to, it's the hardest journey to work on yourself. So the pain is internal, but it's it's almost the pain of working out where your muscles are sore, but you know you're getting stronger. So, Love that. Appreciate you sharing that story. That was a great story. So as we start to bring this in for a landing, Jim, I just I want to open up the floor. Is there any other nugget of wisdom, something that you're seeing kind of in, in today's environment, right, with, with the landscape of executives or anything like that, that you're uh, – like I said, a nugget of wisdom that you want to just put on somebody's ear today that's listening to us. And then tell us a little bit more about that ebook you mentioned about earlier and then anywhere else that people can find and connect with you a little bit more moving forward. Yeah, I think the the message that I would leave for most leaders at this point is if if you haven't recognized the need for change, it, it will find you. And what I mean by that is 
those opportunities that feel like bumps in the road, um, they usually come in things like a downsizing or a death of a loved one, or it might even be in a, in, in a situation where you've got a diagnosis of a disease um, and you're not sure what that is. Those are moments in time when you've been given the opportunity to pause um, forcefully, but the opportunity to pause. And in those moments of pausing are your opportunities to redirect. Um, if you're given those opportunities um, or on the more proactive sense, if you choose to take those opportunities before those, the negative consequences come, you have the chance to say, where am I going in this world? What do I want to do? And those come very rarely. So treat them gingerly. But what, what tends to happen is we're so busy reacting to the world around us that we don't really get to create the future that we want to have. And I can identify that. My corporate world, I was reacting to all the things that I thought people wanted me to do or the things that I thought I should do based upon what successful people in this role have done. Um, or what a good father would be doing, or a perfect husband might be doing. Um, I compared my life to the, the highlight reel of everybody else's Instagram feed, and I started realizing I'm not that good, so I, need, I should be doing this, or I need to be doing that. But I never put myself in the center of accountability and said, I'm going to create this future. Um, when you step into that place of creativity and putting boundaries around the thing that matters in your life, and you put boundaries around the needs that only uniquely you have. What happens is you'll step into this self-authoring future where you realize the personal accountability and the peace and the joy that I've always wanted were always there. I just never took responsibility for making them happen. And it's not going to, the vacuum is not going to, to the vortex is not gonna allow that to just emerge. You will have to step against the vortex and make it happen. And that, that would be my leave behind message for him. Um, yeah, where, where can you find more about this? I mean, the easiest spot is the website, conjunctionleadership.com. If you just like to hear more of my expository thoughts and ram, ramblings, I post regularly on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me under just uh, my name or also Conjunction Leadership. I post both in, in both places there on LinkedIn. We have a little bit of Facebook and uh, Instagram presence, but mostly um, most of my content is going to come through that. If you you want to download the ebook? Um, there's a click on both on my LinkedIn and on my website, conjunctionleadership.com, where you can get it. If you can't find it there, or you get lost in it, just send me an email, Jim at conjunctionleadership.com, and I'll I'll send you a link to it. Um, once you do that, you'll also get subscribed to my newsletter. That's again more ramblings and musings about what is needed in the world um, as it relates to leadership both personal and corporate for us to be able to move to our more, um, a more blissful coexistence as humans. So in the journey of becoming a better human and the journey of creating better humanity, we have to first become a better human ourselves. So love that personal responsibility. That's super key. And that's something that I advocate for here on the podcast and with what I do as well. One thing that I just wanted to tie on there is the ability to respond versus react. When you have personal responsibility and you are taking control of those internal dialogues and everything, the emotions, uh, it allows you then to respond to situations versus react. And I, I, I love that, how you shape that there towards the end. So, folks, I knew this was going to be such a fun conversation. Jim and I, like I said, we just recently reconnected after 10 years, let's say, of, of kind of falling apart there. And, and then it's, it's too bad that it did. Right. This has been so much fun. I. I loved our time together back in the day, standing up in front of groups of people and sharing the message and learning how to, to speak and just all of those things. It was just so much fun back in the day. So folks, I hope you found this conversation super valuable. Reach out to Jim. As he mentioned, you can find him on LinkedIn. It's probably the most prevalent place, but uh, find him, get his ebook, uh, get onto his newsletter, start learning from a man that's been down this travels and obviously with the entrepreneurial journey. And then now he's leading executive teams and, and just really helping people bridge the gap from this life that might seem mundane and, and not really enjoying enjoyable at all. And then really trying to bridge that gap into a life that is really fantastic and fun. So Jim, man, I appreciate you taking the time. This has been a great conversation. I appreciate your hosting me, Randy. Fantastic. So folks, go out there, have a fantastic day. Focus on being great. I look forward to bringing back the next guest to you again very soon. Until then, bye now. Thank you for joining me on the Rich Mind Podcast. And remember, your external world 
is a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So focus every day on that internal battle and win within. Until next time, my friends.